Any item that you get wrong in any dictation, make sure that you find a way to practice it so you can learn to hear it correctly, especially in English. Of course, the exotic sounds we're learning are important too, but, <clears throat> but English is really, really, really important because this is basically an English department. We call it Y Wen Xi, but the most important thing we do here is English. So if you have any trouble recognizing any English sound in any dictation, or if you notice otherwise, besides in a dictation, that you have a problem with a certain sound, add it to your pronunciation improvement program. Everybody get that? Put it in your, your pronunciation improvement program and work on it until you get it, because you will get it. You can do it. If you don't get it now, that means we just haven't worked hard on, enough on it, or there's something that you don't quite understand about it, like the difference between shege and shege and the difference between alveolar and velar. There's probably something there. And all you have to do is go in and find what the problem is and solve the problem. You can solve it. It's not unsolvable. So if you're still getting low scores on English items, on items in an English dictation, use that. That's a gift to you. This is what I still need to work on. So make a list of the things you need to work on, analyze them, classify them, put them into your pronunciation improvement program, find a way to actually fix the problem. You can use online files, audio files, you can get a tutor, somebody who will help you out. Whatever it is, solve the problem, you can do it. All of you have the ears and the brains to do it, so make sure that you actually do it. A very, very quick book sharing because I have a tiny bit of news. I'm going to teach you guys shop next semester. Oh. Is that a big deal? Is that a big deal? <laughs> yeah. Why? I'm one year younger. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Why is it a big deal? It's true that we have uh, many teachers sharing the guide. Yeah. That's true, mm -hmm. but that doesn't answer my question. Why is it a big deal? <laughs> it's just news. Xin Chen? Uh, we hope that we can be taught why. Oh, you hope or you wish you could have? Yeah. Wish or hope? Uh, we wish. Ah, you got to learn that one. I hope we can be taught by you means next year I'm going to take your class, but I wish we could have been. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyway, it's very kind of you. This is the book we're going to use, just to show you in case you're curious. I loaned it to Professor Gao Zhaoming. He will have second semester. I have first semester. And we were discussing which books, book to use. And I said, how about this one? He said, don't worry, I already have it. It's a good book, so it's decided. So if anybody wants to prepare ahead of time, you can give them the news. OK. The other teachers will be uh, Lin Youyu and also um, Xu Jialing Laoshi. And Wang Shanshan Shan will be teaching the following year. So we're going to Lun Liu. It's, it's a very complicated Lun Liu. Wang Shan Shan is the whole year every other year. But then for the years that she's not teaching, plus the other class, those four of us, the four of us will be teaching. Okay, two, two classes, each gets one semester. Okay? Uh, just thought you might be interested. Next thing is vowels and consonants. Chapter 14 for today. Any questions? chart on Wikipedia mm -hmm. and I got roughly uh, 116 to 117 consonants but in this chapter it says that there, it says, says that there are about 600 consonants there like something missing in our chart or okay <laughs> um yeah there's a lot of details and they count things I'm sure they count things like voiceless nasals those, are not, don't, those don't have separate symbols on the IPA chart. They just give you a little circle for anything that's voiceless. Mm -hmm. Actually, we can get this count. It counts them? Uh, they put it on the regular chart, uh, along with the, the voice one. I can't answer because I haven't looked at that chart recently, mm -hmm. but let me write it down. I will try to find out where the differences are. If you want to find out about the many different sounds of the world's languages, 
I recommend the book whose title I just gave you, The Sounds of the World's Languages. Mm, I think that's it. And it's by Peter Latifoget and Ian Madison. I worked through that book very carefully. The hardest chapter for me was Clicks. Clicks was very tiring to read. It was long. And the whole book was kind of demanding for a native speaker who does phonetics. But it's a really excellent book because if you want to know more details about stops, fricatives, clicks, uh, trills, taps, everything, it's all in there. So Peter Latifoget, Ian Madison, I believe it's called The Sounds of the World's Languages. It's a quite accessible book. It's easy to get. And it's relatively easy to read. I mean, it, it takes a lot of concentration, but it's still not one of those really technical reports that are impossible to read. It's still very accessible. I recommend that if you want to learn about many of the different sounds of the world's languages that aren't usually covered. Yeah. I don't know about that one. I will have to look into that. Okay, so I'll, it's Wikipedia IPA chart. And it gave about 160, you say? Yeah, about that. And then this book says over 600, and how do we count for that? I will try to figure that out. Okay, I will have a look. That's a good question. Thank you. Anybody else? On chapter 14 or anything else that's come up in the meantime? Anybody? Please ask quick if you have questions. It says that sibilants are more common than other fricatives because they have more acoustic energy. Mm -hmm. But I wonder what's the relationship between the commonness and the acoustic energy? It means that they're easy to hear and distinguish from other sounds. So um, don't look at me. What sound was that? No, it was. So it's not a very common sound. It is used in a number of languages, but it's not extremely common. English has it, Spanish has it, Greek has it. A number of languages have it. However, it's not extremely common. It has very low acoustic energy. It's the quietest sound in English. That's the quietest sound we have. And if you're on the phone, it's really hard to hear because the phone cuts off the higher frequencies and even some, also some lower frequencies. But the main reason is because it cuts off the higher frequencies. So they all sound the same on the phone. They are not really distinct enough to be really good fricatives. But and shh are very noisy, and those are easy to distinguish from one another. OK? Good. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, on page 166, mm -hmm. it says, uh, very few languages use a uvular trill. So what is a uvular trill? Because it said like in French and German, they use another sound that sounds like uvular trill, but it's not a real one. So what is a uvular trill? It says, they use a sound made with the back of the tongue near the uvula for the sound of R, but it is seldom actually a uvular trill. It's probably a little further back than velar, but not all the way to uvular. So for example, richtig, richtig. It's not quite down to the uvula. It's close. So is, is this uvular trill or not? A uvular trill is, let me get some close right there. It helps. Ah, 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 ah. She'll call this again. Can everybody do it? We're going to be learning it. Uh, your uvula is vibrating back and forth uh, against the root of your tongue, the back of your tongue. Uh, uh. I learned that one in Germany. <laughs> uh. In Germany, they don't usually use the trill unless they're emphasizing something or being sarcastic. So, richtig, you know, if you're going to really make a point, you can do it. I remember my German host father, he would use it when he was acting very authoritative, I'd ask him a question. He, he would discourse on my question, give me a very authoritative, official sounding answer. That's when I heard, uh, most often. But usually there's just a bit of friction. I can say that from my time in northern Germany. So richtig, richtig, It's more fricative, not usually a trill. If you want to make it a trill and show off, you can. But just like in American English, you can say, right, 
I don't usually exaggerate it that much. I say, right. This is a man, Jianghua, he can So the same is true of German and, and these other languages, and French too. Where you will hear a uvular trill is, for example, in the singing of Edith Piaf. Do you know the singer Edith Piaf? Okay, maybe we can play her during break. I mention her almost every year when we talk about uvular trills. Because then she would say rouge instead of rouge. Rouge, it's fricative in normal French, but in her singing, she wants style and effect. So she used a, used a lot of uvular trills. Uh-huh, that answered the question. Yeah, okay, anybody else? Actually, um, actually, the chapters we're covering, covering in vowels and consonants are pretty well key to what we're doing in the book because we're just about to start chapter 8 and we're just about to start chapter 4 in here. And those are pretty well key to each other. So we've done okay this semester. Anything else? If not, please just hand in your summaries. And chapter 4 for next time and chapter 14 for Sylvie. No problem. Did you understand everything in chapter four? No, because, so I'll have to warn you, chapter four is already starting on acoustics and we have not done much on acoustics yet. Everybody listening? There are probably things in chapter four you still won't understand. Don't freak out. I won't be able to give you a complete answer until we get to it in chapter eight. And I've just started preparing chapter eight. And I've discovered this is the first chapter that has been greatly revised. Most of the chapters so far have been almost the same as previous editions. But Professor Johnson's specialty is acoustic phonetics. So suddenly, oh my gosh, hambuso. It's not, but it's different ones, it's a different approach. So chapter eight, I will have to prepare myself to see how he introduces acoustics. Mm, and I hope we can still out do all the activities that we've done other years because there are a lot of fun things we can do. He's going to get more technical than the previous editions were based on what I've seen so far. Some of the things are still the same. Like I see the figures are mostly the same. Okay. So vowels and consonants has been taken care of. And I use the singular there. Vowels and consonants has been taken care of because talking about the book, right. Okay, so what is our job today? It's to finish chapter seven. I don't think we will have time to get to the exercises. So those we will cover on Monday. Test is on Wednesday a week from today. Monday we'll finish going over the exercises and hopefully start on chapter eight. That's the plan. Okay, let's continue with chapter seven and try to finish it up. Go. Um, page 175, third line. You should be able to hear that s, sh, differ from, differ from f, s, in this way. The same kind of difference occurs between the voice fricatives, z, z, and v, z. Okay, I think we have to back up. Can you read the first few sentences? Because we're talking about different ways to classify fricatives. We talked about a grooved tongue versus a flat tongue. And then he says here, this is not the best way to classify fricatives. We're going to separate them on a purely auditory basis. That means we're not going to look what, at what you're doing with your tongue or your other articulatory organs. We're going to use our ears. And last time when we stopped, we said which two have the loudest high pitches, which is what we were just talking about in chapter 14 in vowels and consonants, right? So let's just go over that. Uh, listen as I pronounce these, everybody. What's the loudest? Sh is the loudest. Second loudest? Third loudest? And last is, I just told you, that's the quietest consonant we have. Quietest sound we have in English. Excuse me. And you can hear that s, sh are louder and f, f are softer. Go ahead. And we have similar differences between z, z, those are pretty loud. V, are not quite as loud. Th sounds like a cell phone. Okay. The fricatives s, z, sh, sh, z, are called sibilant sounds. Sibilant sounds. Sibilant sounds. Right. They have more acoustic energy. That is, 
greater loudness at a higher pitch than the other fricatives. Mm -hmm. That is greater loudness. That is greater loudness right. at a higher pitch than the other fricatives. Then the the other fricatives. Other goes high. Then other the, than the other fricatives. There we go. Okay. Your English is really excellent, so I'm going to try to point out things that you still can work on and improve. And one of them is 对比, contrast, contrastive stress, and continuation rise. And I think you already know about those, both of them. Mm, okay, so sibilance in Chinese again. Sin, and we all know about that. We also added ch and j because they contain the fricatives. The affricates are stop plus fricatives, so ch and j contain. Uh, two of these sounds. That's our set of sibilants. One year a student said, I don't know why we have all of these arbitrary categories in phonology. They thought sibilant. What did they, what did they have, uh, what did they establish this category for? Is that true? Is it just for fun? We thought that these had a nice sound and we called them sibilants. Was it just for that? And it was in phonology that this came up. This was in Yugaike many years ago. Um, is it just a random bunch of sounds we put together in a random category? No. What is our basis? Why is it meaningful to have a, a, a category called sibilance? Phonologically, not just phonetically now, but phonologically. That's right. It's because of the English plural forms. Just for that, it's worth it. Because we need a category for that group of sounds that requires us to add uz at the end instead of z or s. So, for that reason, we've already shown that they have a separate kind of behavior in common. All of the sounds do the same thing in the same situation. So, that makes, that justifies establishing a new category. Next. Um, the sound patterns that occur in many languages often arise because of auditory properties of sounds. We can divide fricatives into sibilant and non-sibilant sounds. Sibilant and non-sibilant. Sibilant and non-sibilant and non-sibilant uh, non sounds only by reference to auditory properties. Auditory properties. Auditory properties. Right. Just like sound patterns, even though auditory is an adjective. And... Um, Right, so what they're saying is all we have to do is listen to how they sound. We can divide sounds into sibilants and non-sibilants non on a phonological basis using the plurals rule, but we can also use our ears, okay? Um, we need to divide them into at least two groups to show how English, English plurals are formed. To show how English plurals are formed. To show how... Should not show, look like show. 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 Yep. To show how English plurals are formed. That's one. To show how English plurals are formed. To show how English plurals mm -hmm. are Use the echo. Plurals. To show how English plurals are formed. To okay. show how Engli uh, English plurals... You didn't get the echo. You didn't get the echo. Be very quiet and listen to the echo in your head before you repeat, okay? So watch and concentrate. To show how English plurals are formed. To show how English plurals are formed. That time you had the echo, right? Yeah. I think you heard it because you did it right. Okay. And consider words ending in fricatives such as cliff, moth, 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 m o t h, moth, uh, uh, 就是 like 蝴蝶的那种呃，啊，不是不是那生蛋的，不是那种生很大的蛋的那种。And also m o m, how do you say that? Mom, mom, because. 大英文在演戏的时候 ，somebody said mom, mom. We don't say that. It's mom. Even in British English, you don't say mom. What do you say in British English? Mom. Yeah, M U M. But U in British English is pronounced more ah. So mom, mom in British, mom in American. They're very close, even with, even though they have different spelling. Okay. Moth. Moth. Mm -hmm. Kiss. Dish. Church. Dove. 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 Good. Lathe, lathe, maze, uh, rouge, rouge, judge. Very good. Do you know all these words? Xuan yai, moth, e, kiss, dish, church, dove, bai ge, lathe. What is it? 
Cha Chuang, exactly. Not many people know that. How do you know that? Good for you. Okay. Cha Chuang is a lathe. You know what a Cha Chuang is in Chinese? It's Zhong Wen Dong Ma. Right. I didn't think so. It's not an English problem. It's an object problem. <laughs> um, there's a machine. If you have, say, for example, a, a pillar shaped piece of wood, and then you put it in a machine that holds it on both ends like this. And then the machine turns it around very fast. And then you have a special tool to carve into that so it has indentations that are very For example, the leg to a chair or a bed. And it turns it around really fast. And then you have a knife-like tool. And then you can make an indentation in it. That's a chuang. That's a lathe. All right. So that was an object problem. No, not an English problem. Um, lathe. That's lathe. And maze. Mikong rouge. Right. Hong yanzhi or sai hong. We don't usually say it anymore. My mother used rouge long ago, long, long, long time ago. And judge, we know. Let's make the plural form for each of these, starting with cliff. Just give the plural, don't give the singular. Go. Cliffs. This one becomes voiced. Go on. Kisses. There we go. Now we have the sibilance. They're starting. Next. Right. Not a sibilant. Lathes, this is voice, not a sibilant. Z, huh? Ha 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 ha, so piano. What is it? That's a voice sibilant, right? So we say? Good. Rouges, that's z, not z, it's z. Rouges, but we don't usually say rouges. Many different kinds of rouges, I never heard that. Many different kinds of rouge, I don't think I've ever heard those, the plural. Go ahead, and? Very good, let's go on. Which of these words add an extra hmm? syllable? Which of these words, what? Um, oh, yeah, add, I'm sorry. Um, I thought it was adds, I was jumping. Go, go, you're right, go ahead. Add an extra syllable informing the plural. Right. If you say them. Plural. Uh, plural. Right, why does it go down? Uh, which? It's a WH yeah. word, right. If you say them over to yourself. If you say them over, why do we stress it that way? Because say over is. A uh, phrasal verb, excellent, good. If you say them over to yourself, you will find that they are all monosyllables in the singular. Monosyllables right. in the singular. Right. But those in the singular. We're going to have a contrast with singular. You have to plan and stress it, okay? But those that end with one of the sounds, s, sh, z, z, that is, with a sibilant fricative or an affricate containing a sibilant fricative. All right, we've got repetition here. Can we plan that one before we read it again? Uh, that is. That is. That is. Continuation rise. This is the That is the So that is. That is. With a sibilant fricative or an affricate can. Painting a sibilant fricative. You really need to plan that one ahead. Otherwise, you'll probably just stress everything about with the same amount of stress, and then it won't sound right. Okay, I'm going to do it wrong first and then right and compare the two. And the second one will sound much better to your ears because actually you've heard it correct many times, but a lot of you haven't started saying it that way yourself. Okay? Um, that is with a s wrong way. That is with a sibilant fricative or an affricate containing a sibilant fricative. That's the wrong way. And that's the way most Taiwanese would read it if they were pretty good, right? But the way we really say it is that is with a sibilant fricative or an affricate containing a sibilant fricative. Doesn't that sound better to your ears or not? Does it sound better or not? Be honest, please. Not yet? If it doesn't sound better to your ears yet, then put it in your plan and start working on um, paying more attention to repeated information, taking the stress off of repeated information, putting special stress on contrasted information. Those two go together. 
So that's rule two and rule three. 有点互补的关系 Let me do this two again. Compare them. Listen with really high concentration. 要很专心很专心的听 And listen to your gut. What does it mean to listen to your gut? 你要很注意你自己的直直觉，你的直觉 ，your intuition. Listen to your gut. I mean, your unconscious brain is telling you that's right. That sounds like my native speaker teachers when they're talking English. When you say it the first way, it sounds like most Taiwanese. Your gut will tell you that, because you guys all have the data in your heads. But sometimes your conscious brain is not really zeroing in on it. It's not really paying much attention to it. Everybody's following what I'm saying, right? So you've got the information. Your gut will tell you. Actually, it's your unconscious brain. But your conscious brain may have not yet have decided to really take it seriously. So listen again. Wrong way. That is. With a sibilant fricative or an affricate containing a sibilant fricative. All right, everything has about the same amount of stress. That means the listener will have a hard time identifying what is, what is important and what is different the second time from the first time. That's why we use contrastive stress. So the listener gets a little help in identifying what it is that's so special about the second part that wasn't about the first part. So the correct way. That is with a sibilant fricative, or an affricate containing a sibilant fricative. It doesn't make sense now. Let's try reading it together. Do you remember the right tone of voice? I'll say it one more time, and then we'll try to do it together. That is with a sibilant fricative, or an affricate containing a sibilant fricative. Let's try it. Go. That is. Everything was good except one thing. You put too much stress on one syllable. Everything was good except one syllable. You stressed too much. Anybody know which one? If you stress a syllable too much, the listener will think it's what kind of a stress syllable. If you stress one syllable too much, as compared to the other syllables, remember stress is always relative. 要跟别的有中音的音节相比，你才知道那个 stress 的差别。stress 的差别就是说，一定要跟别的有中音的音节比较，才能知道它的 stress 比较多还是差不多，还是比较少。Okay, which 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 syllable do you think you stress too much? Maybe it wasn't everybody, but a lot of you did. No, in fact, that was the correct one. Where is the tonic? Where is the tonic? Right, tain, isn't it? Since tain is the tonic, where do we have to be careful not to put a tonic? Affricate, you got it. So if you go too high on affricate, your listener will think the tonic. And if it's the tonic, what is the listener going to conclude? I've already got the main point. I don't have to pay attention to the rest. Put this in your notes. This is really, really important. I don't know if there's any book that will tell you this. Maybe there are, but you might not run into it. If you go too high on Africa, your listener will think, "Ah, that's the important point. Therefore, I don't have to pay attention to the rest of the utterance because I already have the most important part." So tonic is very, very important in helping your listener get the point. If you do it wrong, your listener will be very. It'll be tiring, yeah. The listener will be tired, and what else? Confused, misled, 被误导，他会被误导，因而会觉得 confused and tired, all of it together. So we don't want to put too much stress on Africa. It needs to be stressed because Africa is new. However. We need to leave space to go up for the tonic stress. There we go. I'll read it one more time and pay attention to the difference in the amount of stress I put on affricate compared to containing. Okay, that is with a sibilant fricative or an affricate containing a sibilant fricative. Did you hear it? Da 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 da. It's higher, so it's stressed. So. That is with a sibilant fricative or an not stressed, affricate containing. 
a simple infricative. Got it? All right, and that's just a totally normal English pattern. We use these probably thousands of times every day. So it's really, really basic and important. Let's try it again. Go. That is? Good. And at, the only thing you did wrong this time, the level of stress was good. The thing you could improve is cut doesn't have to go down. Africa goes down if it's by itself in isolation, right? Africa. However, we've got something else coming, so let's just keep it level. And Africa con all the way to con and Africa containing. Okay? That's how it works in English. You didn't know that before, I bet. So Africa, Nisha Jiang, we still might think it's a tonic because you've gone down. As soon as you go down, especially if you go down too much, we think it's finished. So one more time, go. With a sibilant fricative, we don't want to go too high. We want to save some height for the second part of the utterance of this part of the sentence. Listen again. Listen to me do it again. Be really sensitive to my level of stress. If I change it, if I go lower, whatever happens, if I pause. That is, with a sibilant fricative, sibilant fricative, it's a little higher, isn't it? But I didn't go sibilant fricative, I didn't go too high. And I certainly didn't go sibilant fricative. So listen again. That is, with a sibilant fricative, or an affricate containing a sibilant fricative. Go. That is? Chica, that was good. Okay, that was a lot of information to get it right, wasn't it? Now, when you think about how many people don't even know what tonic stress is, and then you have to explain to them what's going on here, that would take a lot of explaining, wouldn't it? So, what is the best way? I mean, to get all this information to the minzong of Taiwan, most people are not so sophisticated that they're going to understand or have the patience to go through all of this information, this phonetically oriented technical information. It will be too, too much. They'll get tired of it, right? They're just not going to be interested. It's really important for a teacher to model it correctly. Because if you keep modeling it correctly, it will be echoing in everybody's heads. They may not even know the rule, but they'll start doing it right just because it's echoing in their heads. From the very beginning, your first English teacher is really important. Because very often, your pronunciation hardly changes at all after your very first teacher. A lot of you probably talk to some extent like your first English teacher. Because after that, you're not paying attention to pronunciation. It's not so new and they don't teach it much in class. So if we make sure that the first English teacher that kids get, no matter when they start, if they start in third grade or if they start in fifth grade or if they start in junior high school, that their first English teacher knows what they're doing, right? That's my conclusion. We need good modeling. Because with good modeling, you will, you will pick it up yourself. That's my opinion anyway. Okay, and let's finish the sentence. Become two syllables in the plural. All right. So. If it ends with a sibilant and we want to make it plural, we need to add an extra syllable. So instead of kiss, kiss, we have kiss, kisses, two syllables, okay? It seems, uh, it seems make as the, though... Make the stop at stops more, um, a little clearer. It seems as though... Seem. Seems Good. as though English does not favor two sibling sounds together, uh, two sibling sounds together. It breaks them up by inserting a vowel before adding a uh, adding by inserting a vowel this is a tonic by inserting a vowel before adding a, a sibilant suffix to sibilant sibilant suffix it's not a, it's not a compound uh, a sibilant suffix good. to words ending in sibilants very good excellent we already know this con content really well okay so this should not be a problem he doesn't call it dissimilation but in my opinion, this is my interpretation, this is a kind of dissimilation. Assimilation is, in Chinese, tonghua, and dissimilation is yihua. So this is a kind of yihua. We make the sounds different so that our ears can hear them clearly. Let's go on. <coughs> Trills, taps, and flaps. The most common pronunciation of the sounds written with the of letter. The, uh, the most common. 
the, mo the most common pronunciation of the sound written in the letter R. Mm -hmm. First of all, you said sounds instead of sound, and then you said written in instead of written with. Oh. Now, it doesn't mean, it's not because, well, it, it isn't grammatical, it's true. It's not so much because of that, but remember how we read. We memorize a short phrase, and then we say it from memory. Make sure that when you're filtering, that you don't filter out the original correct words. So you're going to have to pay special attention to word endings and things like shutsu especially, because very often you change a Taiwan English shutsu. Okay? Go ahead, or or Let's try it again. The most, the most common pronunciation of the sound written with the letter R in the languages of the world is triod R. Is tr is the triod yes, R. So slow down. I mean, you're a very fluent reader, but it's better to slow down and get it all correct than read fast and miss a bunch of things. Okay, so slow down. Accuracy comes before everything else. Accuracy is the most important. Um, just like knowing who the queen is and who the former prime minister is. We had a whole, almost a whole discussion, a whole class on this in Dai England. Why are you giggling the way you're giggling? <laughs> uh, Jerome, what was so funny to you? No, no, uh, because I, I, I saw the news that one of our TV, uh, TV company mistake uh, the Queen and the uh, Margaret Thatcher. I understand it wasn't just one. One made the mistake and others copied them. That's like because news nowadays is like copying each other. And that was a really clear path. We could see who copied from who. We know who started. <laughs> copy, 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 haha. We know how the news is put together. Wasn't that creepy? Now this is a serious problem. I don't want to get off on a tangent because we did a whole, practically a whole freshman English class on it this morning and we had a class discussion on it. But the very core of what we were saying is we need Zhashi Xun Lian. I think the Meiti in Taiwan, we should throw away five sixths of it. And we start over. You kind of agree? It's really bad. I mean, Taiwan has a lot of wonderful things for it. I wouldn't insult Taiwan with no good purpose. I don't watch TV. That's the biggest reason. Many people don't. They're sick and tired of it, of the news. It's not just TV news, newspapers. A lot of them, it's the same thing. Mm, it's not totally unrelated to what we're doing here. What we want here is to be zhashi. And um, thinking about my own interests and personality, I'm, I'm a kind of person who gets very heavy sometimes. I like I mean, not junk food, but food, I don't like <laughs> So that's just the kind of person I am. I like things that are concentrated in jiaxi. Some people get scared away from it because it's too intense. But I think Taiwan needs a lot more of that because People are just getting it done for the sake of getting it done, not checking, not taking responsibility, not really caring if it makes sense, it's just going out. So, I mean, that's one of the things that we are trying to do better in this class is be very jashi. I mean, every single thing, I try to point it out so you know exactly why we're doing what we're doing um, and not just say, you did it wrong, do it this way, why? Never mind, just do it. And that has happened before. We also had a discussion about why Taiwan students don't give so much feedback. And did, I don't know if I told you, but one student said that she tried to ask her teacher questions. Did I tell you that story? She would ask in high school, she would ask her teacher questions. And the teacher said, And so he yelled at the student for not paying attention. When that happens, what's, what are the students going to do in the future? No one's going to ask questions. Now, this is one student. She wrote a really nice essay, which, which, even though it was written in Chinese. I don't know if anybody has had somehow similar experiences to this. The teachers give you some kind of, some kind of feedback that shows, I don't welcome your questions. Just shut up and take notes. This is a serious problem. Teachers make mistakes. We make mistakes all the time. Every human being makes mistakes all the time. Students often know it, right? You often know it. 
And then if the teacher doesn't welcome feedback, what do you do? You just let it go and act like there's nothing wrong, right? So that ties together too with what's happening in the news and people not getting good training, people not being used to feedback, not checking their facts, and just putting things through the machine, you know, running them through the machine and then not checking anything. Um, this is something that really needs to be fixed. And I told my freshman, student, freshman English students, I said, you know, you guys are responsible for thinking harder for all these people who do not want to think. Now that's kind of a heavy responsibility, but you guys are here because you're really smart and hardworking. And humans don't like to use their brains to think. We don't like to use our brains. We don't like to because it, it really is tiring to think, all of us. I mean, even those of us who've ended up at this really wonderful university. We still don't like to think too much because it's so tiring. If there's a way to do it easier, our brain will say, do it the easier way, I'm tired. That's the way brains work. Now this is already the top people in Taiwan. Now he Kuang, the people who are not top, they're going to even, it's going to be much worse with them. They're not going to want to think so much and they don't have the tools because they don't have the training and they don't have the motivation. So for those of you who have good brains and good training and lots of motivation, you're going to have to do more thinking for everybody because other people are going to be really lazy about thinking. You're going to have to take more responsibility for what happens in this society. I'm very serious about that. If you just shake your head and say, oh, how dear and how embarrassing, it's not enough, okay? So anyway, in this class, we're being very dashi. We're talking about trills, taps, and flaps, <laughs> okay? Um, right, so. When you're reading, be very careful. Because it's very easy. Through your filter, you're memorizing. Your brain replaces either a Taiwan English variant, some other word or sound, or something that is very tang For example, there's a really funny example. And that is, for, for, for the price of things, we say NT in English. That's 30 NT, that's 100 NT. However, my friend, my, my British teacher, in fact, he said, that's 30 NTU. Yeah, he said that's 30 NTU. But why did he say that? He's very smart. He knows better. He knows perfectly well it's NT. But he said 30 NTU. Why? He's my friend. Therefore, I'm always talking about NTU. So he heard NTU more often than he heard NT. So even when speaking English, NTU popped out just because it's very frequent for him when he's talking to me. So NTU, I, I do it myself when I'm typing, 30 NTU, I will type it. <laughs> it pops out because it is frequent, has high frequency. High frequency things get collected by our unconscious brain. It pops them out without thinking. So I pinu gao, this whole study of what is frequent, less frequent, and very unfrequent. It's really important in language, in learning, in understanding and everything. So frequency level, face on its own yao. Who was it last time who was saying it was Wendy? Wendy's not here today. She said she took that online test of pronunciation that I posted, and some of the words were very unusual. Yeah. And a lot of them had very strange words. I can't think of one right now. Well, for example, trace and trays. Trays maybe is more common than trace. That's not so bad, but some of them use a very unusual word. So she's thinking, ah, or something like that. In any, in any case, the frequency of a word is really important in how language works. So when you're reading, either it's Taiwan English that will pop out, or it's a high frequency word related to it that will pop out. Do you see? Just like NTU pops out when he meant to say NT, okay? So therefore, is the trilled, you have to pay attention. So this is true. We have many kinds of R's in the, in the world, in the world's languages. As we've mentioned, the American R, is it really common or not so common? It's quite uncommon, but like I said, languages that I have had experience with, English, American English, Mandarin, and Dutch in Leiden, Leiden Dutch. So I have learned some languages that have the er sound, but it is not that common. The most common realization, 实现, or 音质, 
realization of the R phoneme is the trill. And it's usually an alveolar trill. Do you all know how to make an alveolar trill? <clears throat> I learned it by practice. In fact, I learned it for German, but the kind of German I should have been learning was standard northern German. But I think I had a southern German teacher who trilled her R's, and I felt I should learn a R. And I just practiced it when I was four years old. I practiced and practiced America, America, until it came out America, America. Okay, I practiced it until it worked. You just have to keep, keep practicing. And the funny memory was what Wukun Zai Di Zhang Lian. I don't know why, but I was only four years old. Okay, um, you need to practice it. Um, that's the most common realization of an R. If you don't know how to do it, you should learn it. And there is a very, I think, a very nice post from an old BBS. Do people still use the BBSs? Yes. Hai Yong. That's amazing. That's, a, that's an old, pretty old technology that's surviving, even in the days of Facebook. The one that you should look at is, what was that, Carol? Did I miss something good? No, I mean, uh, uh, I have to like log into my BBS site every day. Okay, so it's an addiction just like Facebook. Yes. Okay, well that was the bell, but we got a little distracted here. Let's do a little more time. Um, I'll just show you this page on trills. Let's go over it quickly. For those of you who have not yet learned the alveolar trill, this might be useful. All right, how many of you can do the trill? Can. 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 Okay, everybody perform for me and then I'll believe you. You can't. You got it, okay. Not yet, and Sylvie, no. All right, so most of you don't do it yet. Most of you don't know how to do it yet. Um, and I tell a story here that actually happened. It was, it was this first paragraph that tells a story of a former student. This former student used to be my advisee. She used to be my own student in, in phonetics. She now has a PhD from Wisconsin in Yuan Ziliao. Yeah, she's really amazing. And because of this semester, she's the one who went on to Wei Jifen. She got confidence in Su Xue because of some of the things we did in this class. I was very proud of her. I am very proud of her. This is what happened one day. Okay, I'll just read it to save time. Trills again, and R. There's another post on trills. You can read that in your free time if you feel like it. Lots of people here in Taiwan anyway, and probably others whose native language is trillless, seem both fascinated and frustrated by trills. You jit. 很着迷,很有意思的一种音 One day after a class, a student came up to me on the stairway of this building <laughs> And this student ran up to me Alright, and asked, how do you make a trill? <laughs> I asked her if she knew the Chinese folk song Flower drum song, Feng Yang Hua Gu. Part of the chorus goes in ping, ling nang piao yi piao, Can you sing the song? If you start on a D, it's sort of like a starting block for a race. It pushes you off into a trill. Everybody try the Feng Yang Hua Gu line. <laughs> We've got some very good trillers here. Durr, all right, that's step number one. Let's try to make it a project, a class project. Everybody learn how to make an alveolar trill. Because if you finish second semester of phonetics and people say, oh, okay, make a trill for me. You go, oh, I never learned that. <laughs> do it in, right? Not as bad as mixing up Thatcher and the Queen, but still kind of do it. <laughs> all right. So put it in your notes. I want you to try and learn the alveolar trill. It can be learned, but it takes practice. Like I said, when I was a kid, I had to practice a few hours before I got it, but I got it. So, the first thing is Fo Yang Hua Gu. That's one way. Listen to the song, find it on YouTube, and practice it yourself. All right, that's the first one. If you can sing this, right, 
when you're singing it, then you have an alveolar trill. The student tried it, and on the spot, it worked. How just a zhang hao? Okay, I said, you try this song, and then she started singing. I said, that's it. She said, okay, thank you, and then she walked away. <laughs> it was the funniest thing. Just that the conversation was very short. It worked. She Okay, and then she took the class later on in the future. But what if you don't get the dr right? If you can sing the song, but the dr is not correct. Some former students have suggested a method they read on the BBS that helped them, they say. And it's right here. I'll just show it to you really quickly. It's in Chinese. All right, it's a little bit long, not that bad. Just read it yourself. It tells you how to, the toang, what's funny? <laughs> what's that? You didn't quad down. Is that is that why it's funny? It's probably because like people have suggested ways, but then they needed to use water or something, and then so you have to do like yeah yeah gargling gargling or something. Uh huh. Okay. Oh, that's right. That's right. Um, okay. So she explains it here, and basically, basically what she's saying is, the reason is because that relaxes your tongue. Okay, don't overdo it. But if you're a little bit wang ho, because you cannot have muscle tension in the front of your tongue. So because it's in free vibration. It's in free vibration. Okay? So that's that's basically the suggestion. When you have time, you can read the Chinese, okay? So, BBS post. Mm, it suggests that you push the back of your tongue against your vela in order to relax the tongue enough so it can go into free vibration. This may not be the way you make a trill once you have mastered it. So, Okay, for example, okay. But it has helped some people successfully produce their first trill. So those are two methods now. Feng Yang Hua Gu is number one. Leaning your head back a little. Somebody suggested doing it in the bathtub. Some people told me it worked for the first time when they were taking a bath. All right. And here is a whole linguist post on it. Those of you who are really gung ho, if you want to keep up with what's going on in linguistics, you can ding yue the linguist list. This was the first list I ever subscribed to on the internet over email. It wasn't, wasn't the internet then, it was the email. And that was in 1993. <laughs> Right, 1993, a friend says, Karen, you've got to get email. I'm coming to your house. I'll show you how to use it. <laughs> you have to learn it. That's how I learned how to do email. Then I started teaching my students. Okay, the very first list that I subscribed to was the linguist list. Linguist list. So I've been on there since 1993. And that was in 2001. <laughs> Lots of suggestions. So, you just keep going until one of them works. Okay. And one thing you can try is using the English, the American English tap, because if you get a lot of taps going, then you will get a trill. So, I edited it. 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 I, edited it. I, edited it. I don't really. I don't know if this really works well because you're using muscle tension. And muscle tension does not work with, with a trill. So I edited it. I edited it. Huh? Anyway, it's an idea, just for your reference. There's an even longer one in a linguistics text. It's deadheaded ed edited it. Deadheaded ed edited it. Ah, I said the whole thing. Okay, how? Huh? All right, so this is about the alveolar trill. And then, 
for the uvular trill, in English they sometimes call it a burr, B-U-R-R. Burr is Burr是会粘在衣服上的那些植物的纸，就是类似那个咸丰草的鬼针草的那种东西，那个是burr。But其实那些不是，它是一个圆球，上面很多刺，然后会勾到衣服上。That's a burr. But that's also another. It's a colloquial word for the uvular trill. Uh, practiced by gargling. Shuko. Uh, this sound occurs in the speech of some older speakers of Northumbrian English, spoken on the northeastern coast of England, but it is dying out. I have heard that it's pretty much gone now. 就是英国的哪里？东北岸本来有个方言，有这个burr，这个uvular then here's a page from the BBC. They will have some speakers who still have this burr. Um, I checked the links, it should be working. Okay, so I, I think that was it. It went by really fast, but yeah. So they have uvular trill in this variety of British English, but it's pretty much now extinct. Yeah. Okay, so that's it. We'll take a break now. <laughs> Okay, let's get back to trills. We're talking about trills so far, and taps and flaps are coming. And we noted first that the most common realization of the R phoneme is the trill, the alveolar trill. It's the most common. So if we don't know anything about the language and we see an R, we can guess. I bet they pronounce it as a trill, and it really is true. Think of the languages that you've learned. Not all of them, but many of them will have a trill. Georgian uses a trill, for example. Russian and Georgian, they both use trills. And Spanish and Italian, many other languages you can think of. Some varieties of German and Dutch use trills. Um, the R actually is often um, subject to, uh, to Sprachbund um, effects. Everybody remembers what a Sprachbund is. So you'll find that there's a very large area of northern Europe, northern France, and the Netherlands and Germany, all of them, they tend to use a r, they use a uvular sound. A huge, huge area. That's an aerial effect. And then in Germany, as you go further down, you will find alveolar trills. So depending on the part of the country, you will find different realizations of the R. So just by saying that this language has a r, it doesn't mean that all varieties of that language have a r. Or you say that standard German uses a uvular R, but non-standard varieties use something else, maybe an alveolar trill. Okay, let's continue. This is why the IPA uses the common letter R for the trio, it uh, for trio, mm -hmm. and the typographically unusual, Typa. typographically mm -hmm. unusual symbol upside down R for the phonetically unusual rhotic approximate found in English. That's good, but slow down a bit. Put some pauses in, remember how to phrase, don't you? Okay. <coughs> Some languages contrast a long contrast. contrast, a long and short trilled R. You can listen to this contrast in Icelandic by looking at the Icelandic page on the CD. Use the language index to find the page. The spectrogram in figure 7.4 shows an Icelandic minimum pairs contrasting this, these sounds in words saura und, general plural, a genitive genitive plural, and saura, sor, uh, genitive plural. As the arrows in the spectrogram indicate, in the short r, there is one con contact of the tongue on the roof of the mouth, while in the long r, there are three contacts. Oops, more than three. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In both cases, the tongue contacts in the trio are driven by an aerodynamic force in much the same way that the vocal force vibration in the voicing is driven by airflow. So, even in the case of a very short trio in which there is only a single contact with the roof of the mouth, the movement is dif different from that in a tap, in a tap or a flap. In the trio, uh, in a trio, the tip of the tongue is set in motion by the current of air. 
A tap or a flap is caused by a single contraction of the muscles so that one articulator is drawn against another. It is so that, once more? So that one articulator, articulator. articulators, mm -hmm. one, arti one, one articulator is drawn against another. It is often just a very rapid stop gesture. Uh, what kind of gesture? Um, rapid? Rapid stop gesture. Mm -hmm. Oh, stop gesture. There we go. Okay. And we're going to get the Icelandic data ready here. And we've got, so, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so we have a minimal pair contrasting which sounds? A long and short trilled R. Okay, and this one should have a long trill. All right, you can hear the difference? Let's listen again. Sorry. And you can hear the r. So they have saura and saura. Long and short trill. And it's almost like the difference between a tap and a flap, but maybe the first one. A tap is defined as having just one contact with the alveolar ridge, and maybe their short trill can have more than one. But it's almost like the difference between a tap and a trill. All right, so that's long and short trill in Icelandic, and they're contrastive. And the movement is still different from that of a tap. I said they sound similar, but the movement is still different from that of a tap or of a flap. Now, I think I've mentioned before that in Americanist usage, they use flap instead of tap. For the English, American English, water, water. That's a the sound, right? I call it a tap because I follow the usage of this book. I probably the most, the majority of ESL textbooks will call it a flap. They will say the sound is flapped. Keep in mind that when they say flap, they mean what we're calling a tap because we're going to use flap for a different kind of sound. It's related, but it's different, all right? So, how is a tap different from a trill? A tap is one contact. It's caused by a single contraction of the muscles so that one articulator is thrown against another. So our alveolar tap is not the only kind of tap. There could be other kinds of taps. In Minayu, I mentioned you have a lateral tap. We talked about that with tara. Do you remember? That's also alveolar, but it's lateral. The air is coming out the sides of the tongue, tada. And um, in any case, a tap is just one contact. It's just one contact, a single contraction. But a trill has at least how many contacts? Three. Sangha yi shang, and then it's a trill. Um, a, what is a flap? We're going to find out in the next paragraph. Is this okay for this paragraph? Let's go on. It is useful to distinguish between taps and flaps. In a tap, the tip of That's the... That's good, but slow down because these are keywords. Whenever you've got keywords, make them long and pause, okay? In a tap, the tip of the tongue simply moves up to contact the roof contact. of the... Contact. Contact mm -hmm. the roof of the mouth in the dental or alveolar region. Alveolar region. Alveolar region. Re... Re... Uh -huh. Region. Right. And then moves back to the floor of the mouth along the same path. Okay, everybody say water. 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 Yeah, not water. Water is British. Water. 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 Feel what your tongue is doing. It's doing. Say it a few times. Water. 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 It's probably not the way you usually say it. Do you usually say it that way or not? Amy does. How about the rest of you? Water. How do you usually say it? You still say water. Well, if you're learning an American accent, it's useful to try and train yourself to use the tap because that's the way we say it. Water. Water. We don't say water. Water. Everyone, water. Water. Not wa. It's wa. Water. 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 Better. 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 Okay? That's the tap. Uh, hmm. All right. And then how about for tara? 
If you speak Minayun, and even if you don't, if you know a little bit, say Tala a few times and figure out what your tongue is doing and feel how different or similar it is to the American tap. Try. Okay, Jerome, you're a native speaker. So what's your feeling about Tala? Mega Mega In. Okay, so there's much lighter contact, and it's definitely lateral. It's definitely lateral. And you can't hold it long. That's the main thing that I keep telling you about taps. They cannot be lengthened because tala is not correct. Tala. Tada is also, that's worse. Actually, tala I think is better than tada. Tada. Okay? Bijiao chilai. Tala is not good, but tada is worse. Right? Is that right? Yeah, but it should be short. It shouldn't be lengthened. It shouldn't be tala. It should be tala. 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 Very light. Yo pong dao ma. It's lateral. I don't think people have written about it, especially from the point of view of analyzing it as a tap and a lateral tap. Somebody needs to write about it. So if somebody needs a topic for 研究所的研究报告, that's one that's not been written yet. But I think it's a really interesting topic because it's a sound that's hard for foreigners learning. Not just foreigners learning Minayu. Maybe if you're not a native Taiwanese and you're learning Minayu, who is not a native speaker of Minayu? All right. Well, you sort of are. But I didn't grow up listening to speak. Okay. Okay. So for those of you for whom Minayu is not a native language, learning Tala, Tala, is that difficult or is it not so bad? Non natives, please answer. Not so hard? You're a native. Okay, sorry. Non natives? You mean you're a non native? You're native. Okay, who else is non native? Okay, Nima? Oh, Xiaoto. Xiaoto, yeah. All right, so how about if Jerome judges, because your Minayu is pretty good? How about if you have them say it and see if they say it correctly by your standards? Start with Miranda. It's acceptable, but it sounds a little off or yeah. not? You know, too much, too much D. Yeah, too much D. Too much D should be more L, right? Should be more lateral. Okay, that that answers my question. Thank you. Okay, let's try. Let's try Tina. Too much D. Too much D. Okay, for both of them, too much D. There we go. That's the answer I wanted. Okay, that's what I suspected. Because this sound also confused me. I learned Minayu mainly from Luin Dai and from a Kopen. And this sound, is that an L? No, it's not an L. It's not a D. It's not, it's not a regular American tap. So this one, this one had me confused until I learned more phonetics. Then it made more sense to me. Okay, someone should write about that. It's a really interesting sound. And the other, the other transient sounds, we call them transients, the Shun Jian de Yin that happen with linking in Minayu are also interesting, like jilep, jileba, nega b. We get a voiced b there. Lep, that's voiceless, but leba is voiced. So Minayu, the zixie transient in linking sounds, then is a manyo chu de. Okay. All right, continue, please. In the flap, the tip of, in the flap, the tip of the tongue is first curled up and back in a retroflex gesture and then strikes the roof of the mouth in the post-alveolar region, re region as it returns to its position behind the lower front teeth. Uh, the distinction between taps and flaps is thus to some extent bound up with what might be called a distinction in place of articulation. 
Um, flaps are typically retroflex. Typically, don't pronounce typically. the A. The A is not pronounced. Flaps are typically retroflex articulations, but it is possible to make uh, the arti the articulatory mm -mm. articulatory mm? articulatory. There we go. You got it. <laughs> the articulatory gesture required for a flap at pause. I knew you weren't gonna pause. I could feel it. <laughs> okay. When you come to a jieshi zi, lian jie zi, remember to pause. Otherwise, it's hard to understand. So, but it is possible to make the articulatory gesture required for a flap. Uh huh. Uh, required for a flap at other, place, other at other places of articulation. Beautiful. The last time you got it just right. The timing was perfect. Other is contrastive. All right. Other there is contrastive. Let's go on. Uh, the tongue can be pulled back and then pulled back, pulled back and then okay. pull, pull back and then and then as it is flapped forward, okay. made to strike the alveolar ridge. Make make the make made to strike the alveolar ridge. Made uh -huh. Made to strike the alveolar ridge uh -huh. or even the teeth. Uh -huh. Making alveolar or dental flaps. Okay. Flaps are distinguished from taps by the direction of the movement, from back to front for flaps. For uh, flaps. For flaps. Okay. Up and down for taps, rather than by the exact exact point of contact. All right. This one paragraph takes care of this issue pretty much of taps and flaps. Just remember that a tap is like the American water. And minayu tala, both of those are taps. But a flap, your tongue starts in the back and goes forward. For a tap, your tongue goes up and down. Water, water, ada, it is. It goes up and then down. Everybody got that? For a tap, up and down. But for a flap, it's usually retroflex, which means your tongue is curled inside, right? And then you uncurl your tongue and hit something, usually your alveolar ridge, and that's a flap. A flap is with ah, something like ara, ar, ar, make it ar, very retroflex, ara, ara, that's a retroflex flap. Let's practice it a few times. I'll model it for you as best as I can do it. I don't use it, although some people use it in American English, he's going to say in the next paragraph or so. For example, dirty, dur, we have to curl our tongues. If you, if you have a curled tongue retroflex for dur, you might make a flap. So let's just listen for a while. My original example was arda, 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 arda. For dirty, I don't curl my tongue, but if I did, dirty, 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 dirty. When I make the D coming out because my tongue was curled up, it's back to front instead of up to down. Okay? So everybody, first of all, try water, water, tada, tada. Okay? Now try arda. Ara. Curl up your tongue. Ara. Now that's a flap. If you've curled up your tongue from the inside coming out from the back to the front, that's a flap rather than a tap. So when you see all of those ESL texts that say uh, the word water is flapped, you just know they're talking about taps. You don't have to argue with them. There's no point. Okay? <laughs> all right. So try dirty but make a retroflex er for dir. I don't do it usually, but I do it on, I can force myself. Dirty. 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 There. If you curl up your tongue, dirty. dirty. Then that's a flap. Okay? That's what we need to know about taps and flaps mainly. Any questions? All right. Let's go on. Some forms of American English have American you in. American English All right. have both taps and flaps. Taps occur as the regular pronunciation. Regular. Reg Right, remember if it's not alveolar, we're going to keep the U. And by the way, I told you that after alveolar consonants, usually the U is dropped, right? But I was listening to Chang Chun Chung this morning. Angela was on. And she said, Liur. Liur in Yo. I think that was what she said. It was Liur. But she definitely had a Y. So it's not gone. Some people still have it. Okay. Taps occur as the regular. 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 Right. 
pronunciation. Pronun oh. A lot of you are saying pronunciation, but it's pronunciation. 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 Good. Of t the n n in words such as letter, letter, and tenor. All right. When I say them, the first two are often the same if I'm speaking fast. Listen. Ladder, ladder, tanner. But if I'm speaking very slowly and distinctly, I can say ladder, ladder, tanner. Now you hear the difference really clearly, right? When I'm speaking quickly, there is no difference. There may be a difference in vowel length. Which one may have a longer vowel? Ladder, the second one. But listen, I'll try to say it and see if you can hear a vowel length difference or other differences. Ladder, ladder, Tanner. Ladder, ladder, tanner. Now, if I force it, you can hear a vowel length difference, but normally in speech you will not hear it. Native speakers won't hear it. Mm, there is a, there is a potential difference. Let's call it a potential. Tanner. What's a tanner? That's tanning. That's called tanning. And a person who does that is a tanner. Okay, let's try those, everybody. Ladder, ladder. Let's do all three together. Listen first. Ladder, ladder, tanner. Go. Ladder, ladder, tanner. You made them very clear. You made the difference very clear. So that's how you can distinguish them if you want to. Let's go on. The flap occurs in words that have an R-colored vowel in a stressed syllable, in dirty and sorting. Speakers who have the tongue in bouncing. In dirty and sorting. In dir dirty and sorting. Speakers who, who have the tongue bunched. Who have the tongue paused. <laughs> paused, not paused. Who have the tongue bunched or retracted. Who have the tongue bunched or retracted. Did it say bunched? Bunched. Bunched. Bun. Bun. You have too much. Open your mouth wider. Bunched. You have a little so good. so good. Bunched. That's better. Everyone, bunched. Good. Who have the tongue bunched? Longer. Open your mouth more. Bunched. Bunched. What's more? Bunched. Yeah, be careful that there's no elf, no velar there. Okay. Or retracted for the R colored for the, the. For the mm -hmm. R colored vowel will produce a flap as they move the tongue forward for the non R colored vowel. Non. No. Na. That's the ah, but the uh, it's ah. Non R colored vowel. Non. No, not non. Non. No. Just say na. Nan. Nan. There. Yeah. Nan. Yeah. Nan. Our colored vowel. We already practiced that. So once more, everybody, try it with curling your tongue. Dirty. Dirty. Sorting. 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 Okay. Next reader. Are we all clear? Okay. Trails. Trails are rare in most forms of. In. Not in. 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 That's better. In most most forms of English. The stage version of a Scottish accent with trilled R is not typical with trilled R it with trilled R is not typical of most Scots. In Scottish English R is more likely to be pronounced as a tap. The American pronunciation of paddle with a voice alveolar tap in the middle. In the middle. 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 Not middle. Isn't it middle? Middle. Middle, yeah. Not middle. 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 Right. Okay. Will sound to a Scotsman from Edinburgh like. Edinburgh. Okay, the American pronunciation is Edinburgh because we don't know how to say it right. <laughs> but the Scottish or the, the UK pronunciation is Edinburgh. 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 You'll add a schwa at the end. Everybody, Edinburgh. 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 If you say that, you will 
command everybody's respect. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Edinburgh, right. like this, like his regular pronunciation of pearl. And that's that's a really funny comparison because it works really well. Uh, let me see if I can find something in Scottish English. Here we go. Okay, that's a good example. Um, I had another tape, but we don't use cassette tapes anymore, so I had to find something else. This one is a really interesting comparison because it works really well. So say "huaban" in American English, with a tap. Pedal. 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 It's almost exactly how someone speaking Scottish English says "jenju." Almost exactly a pedal. Pedal. Isn't that amazing? "Huaban" in American becomes "jenju" in Scottish English. Pedal. Pedal. Almost exactly the same. There's a little difference, but not much. So let's just listen a little bit to Scottish English. Remember, we've talked about the vowels, the a ah and the a eh merge into a single vowel. So they say father, fa. It's not fa and it's not fa, it's father. And then man would be man instead of man, man, father. So a eh and a ah merge into the same vowel. Let's just listen. Most famous, fe. It's not fe. Fei, it's a monophthong. Yeah. Listen to his R's. Listen to his R's. After. After. Did you hear it? And then it's not after and it's not after. It's after. 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 And he had a little. Listen. So sometimes I think the R is sort of like a British post vocalic R. doesn't get pronounced much, but then sometimes it is a trill. Hearing. Hearing. All right? So that was a pretty good sample. I'll, Try to remember to put it on um, Facebook so you can hear it again. Mm, okay, pedal, pedal. Let's go on. The distinction between trills, not trills, 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 uh -huh. and different kinds of taps and flaps is much more taps and flaps. Taps and flaps uh -huh. is much more important. Important. In important. And Angela says important. I heard it this morning. Okay. <laughs> more important. In other languages, but before this point can be illustrate, mm, point illustrated, illustrated, but before this point can be illustrated, but before this point can be illustrated, okay. we must review the symbols, Sim symbols okay. that can be used for different types of art sounds. In a broad transcription for English, oh, there's an N transcription. Tra transcription Good. for English. Good. They can all be transcribed as R, but in a narrow, but in a, but in a narrow transcription, narrower. but in a narrow, narrower yeah. transcription, the symbols, this symbol may be restricted be voiced to voiced alveolar trills. Alveolar trills. Alveolar trills. Alv. Alveolar trills. An alveolar, uh, an alveolar tap. Mm -hmm. No, the first time was better. An alveolar tap. An alveolar tap. Alveolar tap. No, it's not a compound. Alveolar is a xionzi. An alveolar tap mm -hmm. may be symbolized by the special symbol tap. Tap. Mm -hmm. And the post alveolar retroflex flap. Retroflex. Retroflex okay. flap. By R with a hook. That's easy to remember. Remember, retroflex is always that hook down there to the right. So remember these two symbols. You already know tap, but now add a retroflex uh, flap as well. An R with a little hook. That's easy. Okay. The, the approximate Approx approximate Good. that occur in most uh, that, what? that occurs uh -huh. in most Curs occurs Good. the most Americans. Pronunciation. Say Americans. Americans. Now it's good. Pronunciation of R may be symbolized by R. Just keep going. <laughs> An upside down R. Good. If if it is important. Uh, important. If it is important. There you go. To show that. It's not unt. Important. And don't open your mouth for unt. It's important. 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 
important. That's it. Everyone, important. But like I said, a lot of people now say important. I heard it this morning from Angela, and Angela is only a little bit younger than me. Okay? So she's, she's not as young as you, and she says important. So I guess it's getting popular, but I still say important, important. Go ahead. If it is important to show that this sound is particularly retroflex, is, is particularly, once, once again, particularly, particularly, good. Retroflex. Retroflex. The, retroflex. Good. The symbol, the symbol may be used. All right. Upside down R with a hook. And we use that for Beijinghua, the R, the R. We use the symbol. Remember that. We learned it last semester, but this is a good review. Upside down R and then add a retroflex hook. Now it's easier to remember because you understand how it works. So R, the R, mm -hmm. Most speakers of American English do not have a retroflex approximant. But for those who do, R is an appropriate symbol. Appropri appropriate. Appropriate. There you go. Good for you. Okay. Symbol. Sim symbol. Good. In a, in, a in a narrow transcription. Good. All these symbols are shown in table 7.6. All right, let's look at 7.6. I thought we'd finish the chapter, but we are not going to. Okay, we go until 310, right? I don't think we're going to make it. Mm, we're close, though. Let's look at this table. So first of all, we've got a plain R, which is voiced alveolar trill, and that's the word for dog, which is spelled P-E-R-R-O in Spanish. Perro. 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 All right, the next one is the voiced alveolar tap, and that one's got just one, one flap of the tongue there. It's pero. Pero. Good. The next one is a voiced retroflex flap, and we've got something from hausa or auza here, which means servant, and that would be para. 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 Curl up your tongue and then open it up. Bada. All right. The next one is the voiced alveolar approximant from American English. And that's easy? Red. Red. All right. And if it's really er and we curl our tongue er, then we can use the retroflex uh, symbol. Okay. And then um, the next one is a alveolar fricative trill. And this is in Czech. So it's a, it's a regular alveolar trill, but it's fricative. So we've got more noise in there. So it's like rek, 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 rek. We've got friction in there, rek, okay? And the next one is a voice uvular trill. Here it's not usually a trill. It's not usually a trill, but it could be. And when al uh, um, when Edith Piaf sings, then it is. So, rouge, oh, rouge, okay, rouge. And then we have a voiced uvular fricative or approximate. If we have noise, if we have friction, then it's a fricative. If we don't have that frication, then it's just an approximate in, in, and that's rouge, rouge, rouge. Rouge has got friction and rouge does not. They're very close. So, approximate and fricative. Lugus of voice del uvular de hua. Dosion zega fu hao. Pay attention to it because I have a little. I don't think I'm dyslexic. Because it's tang lang si wang, wang yo hai se wang zuo, wo hai wang ji. So remember, it's like a da xie de ar. Nigga gu zuo de di fang se wang yo. Remember that. Because this is a really useful symbol because a lot of you are learning French, right? And for German as well. Then the next one is a. Not voiced. 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 That's better, right? Voiced, voiced bilateral trill. And this is in Kele, which, as I remember, is I think it's a Papuan language. All right. So how are we gonna make a voiced bilateral trill? Usually, you start with an M. Puni. <laughs> You're great. <laughs> That's a voiced bilateral trill. It is not very common, but usually it has an M in front of it. Jibusu. Then we have something else. We have a. Are we okay? Anything interesting? 
Oh, really? Yeah, it is. It's much harder without the M, which is why it always occurs with M as far as I know. It's not common, but when you find it, it has an M in front of it. And the last one is a Xing Hao. We use a Xing Hao when in the IPA. A special symbol. We, we don't have a ready-made symbol among the ones they give us, and we found a sound that we need to represent, and that's part of the answer to Carol's question. Yeah. But it's a very small answer. <laughs> so you... You, play, you, you, you replace all the symbols that you're not sure with the uh, accessory? Not sure of it. Uh, it can be when you're not sure of it, but usually when it's a sound that doesn't seem to be in the table, it's something unusual. Before we had lingual labials, remember? La, na. That symbol is a brand new one. That's the newest symbol added, as far as I remember. Okay, so when we find a symbol, we find a sound, and we don't have a ready made symbol for it, and then we put a little note in our paper what it means. In this case, voiced labiodental flap. Let's try that with be and u, with a voiced labiodental flap between it. Try it. Be bu. Be bu. 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 Okay, there we go. So that accounts for one, one of the sounds that you're asking about. Mm -hmm. Let's go on. As illustrated in Table 7.6, Spanish distinguishes between a trail and a tap in words such as perro, dog, and perro, but. Similar distinctions also occur in some forms of Tamil, a language of southern India. Southern, the, not southern, southern. Southern. Good. India. Mm -hmm. This language, like Hausa, Nigeria, may also distinguish between an alveolar tap and a retroflex flap. Trails may also have accompanying friction, as in the Czech example in Table 7.6, which uses the IPA diacritic, meaning raised and thus more fricative. Um, so let's just go over this, this uh, paragraph before we stop. Um, we've already mentioned that Spanish distinguishes between a trill and a tap. A trill is written with a double R. And also, if a word starts with a single R in Spanish, that is also a trill. So for example, red is rojo. If it's the first R in a word, it is also a trill. And there are also distinctions like this in some forms of Tamil. Tamil the Moishe Fang Yan, that's the Nan Indu, the Dravidian language to eat, and Hausa. And then in Czech, we have a very special one. And then they have an IPA diacritic. We've used that for what? Vila raising, right? Like in bang, and in length, and in sing, right? We use that symbol because it means to put the tongue higher. And that means it's more fricative. So instead of a regular um, alveolar trill, rrr, you're putting your tongue closer up so we're getting noise because there's air rushing through a smaller space. So like um, rrk, rrk, rrr. your tongue is closer and we're getting more noise. Okay, we didn't finish, but we're still doing very well. <clears throat> we will absolutely finish on Monday. And I hope to still have the test on Wednesday if possible. So Monday, our main goal is remember to hand in your notes. We'll finish chapter seven. We'll go over the written and performance exercises. Now, in the written exercises, they say <clears throat> there are fewer exercises here because you should be doing bigger projects. You should be trying to do transcriptions of other languages. More ambitious teachers would have you do that, but I'm not doing that in this class because it takes a lot of time. It really takes a lot of time. I once taught a phonetics two course. Jiban Sang, so it was only part two of this book, but we had a whole year to do it. And we did do things like that that year, but it really takes a lot of time and effort. The Guoqing Zhongxin is a really good place to find unusual languages, like from Africa or from the Solomon Islands or from, from Central America or something. You can find unusual languages easily, but we're not going to do that part. It's just too much. It's too ambitious for what we're trying to do. So do the exercises. You don't have to do that part. If you want to do it as a personal project, 
you know, of course, could you have fun? No problem. But um, we're not going to make it a requirement. Mm. These take some thought, so start early on them. So for Monday, um, notes, finish the chapter, mark the exercises. That should probably take up both, both hours, and then test next Wednesday if all goes well. Okay? We'll see you on Monday.